and there are not. It comes about when evidently occurring, but not when not evident. So saying, Mahamati, of things with the causes and conditions of existence, one attributes cause to the world. Then how does one become attached to non-existence? It means while accepting passion, animosity and delusion, yet one imagines passion, animosity, and delusion have no actual existence. Between one who does not accept the existence of things because of detachment from the appearance of being, and one who does not acknowledge passion, animosity, and delusion in Buddha's, listeners, and solitary illuminates, saying they are not there due to liberation from the appearance of being, which of these, Mahamati, is the nihilist? Quote, Mahamati said, the one who has accepted passion, animosity, and delusion yet doesn't admit them. Quote, the Blessed One said, good, good, Mahamati. It is very good indeed, that you have spoken thus. One does not become a nihilist only by disavowal of the existence of passion, animosity, and delusion. One also negates Buddhas, hearers, and solitary illuminates. Why? because of the internal and external ungraspability of afflictions. For passion, animosity, and delusion cannot be apprehended internally or externally, having no body. And by the refusal to acknowledge those without passion, animosity, or delusion, one negates Buddhas, hearers, and solitary illuminates. They are naturally liberated, those Buddhas, hearers, and solitary illuminates, due to the non-existence of anything to be bound, or a cause of bondage. It is when there is something to be bound that there is bondage and a cause of bondage. So saying, Mahamati, one becomes a nihilist. This, Mahamati, is the definition of non-existence and existence. It is in reference to this that I have said. A notion of personality as big as the polar mountain is better than the notion of emptiness of those who overestimate non-existence and existence. For those who overestimate non-existence and existence become nihilists. One whose mind has fallen into individual and common notions without acknowledging it because of having no realization that they are constructions of subjective mental objects. Due to not acknowledging it, due to the consequent view of permanence associated with external existence, conceiving the clusters, elements, and media, which are apart from any form of construct, as each instant distinctly separate, stopping and disappearing as a continuity, also becomes a nihilist. So it is said, the range of thought is as far as the two ends of is and is not. By blocking its range, accurate thought is destroyed. When there is no grasping of objects, there is no destruction in negation. As there is reality as it is to the wise, as such, as a realm. Whatever comes to be after not having existed, having come to be passes away too. Being and non-being are not fixed by assumptions in my teaching to you. Not by philosophers, nor by Buddhas, not by me or by anyone at all is existence proven by assumptions. How can negation be? How can there be proven existence of anything to which non-existence applies? Non-existence and existence are construed by the erroneous notions of doctrines of origination. Whatever involves nothing at all that originates or passes away the world does not find its existence or non-existence when seeing clearly. Quote, then Mahamati, the great Bodhisattva, also entreated the Blessed One. Let the Blessed One teach me, let the Felicitous One teach me, let the realized, able, perfectly enlightened One, best of speakers, indicate to me the leading principle of the goal, by which description of the leading principle of the goal. Properly analyzed, I and other great bodhisattvas may quickly awaken supreme perfect enlightenment and become free of any need for others' guidance, from any religious or philosophical dogmatists. Quote, the Blessed One said, then listen, Mahamati, and take it to heart accurately and aptly. I will tell you. Quote, very well, Blessed One. 
So saying, Mahamati listened to the Buddha. The Blessed One said this to him. The leading principle of the goal of all hearers. Solitary illuminates, enlightened people, and people living for enlightenment, is twofold, namely the leading principle of the goal and the leading principle of instruction. The leading principle of the goal. Mahamati. Is distinguished by first-hand experience. Beyond speech. Imagination. And words. Reaching the realm where there is no impulse, the inherent characteristic of arrival at the stage of first-hand realization, excluding all the destructive forces of speculation and dogmatism. Having struck down all those demons of dogmatics, first-hand realization reigns. This, Mahamati, is a description of the leading principle of the goal. Then what, Mahamati, is the leading principle of instruction? that is to say the diverse instruction of the nine-part teaching. Excluding suppositions of other and same, real and unreal, led by employment of skill in expedient means, is discerning accommodation to people's conditions. Whatever anyone feels confidence in, that is what to teach that individual. This, Mahamati, is a description of the leading principle of instruction. You and other great bodhisattvas should apply this in practice. So it is said. Aim and leading principle, first-hand experience and instruction. Those who see cognizant of the distinctions are not under the control of speculation. Existence is not really there as imagined by the naive. Why don't logicians seek liberation by non-existence? Those viewing the constructed as bound to origination and dissolution. Develop dualism but do not see, due to perversion. There can only be one truth, nirvana detached from intellect. One should see the imagined world as insubstantial, an illusion, a reflection. Passion is not really there, nor animosity, delusion, or personality. All the clusters seem to be there, like dreams, due to craving. Quote, At that time Mahamati, the great Bodhisattva, also entreated the Blessed One, let the Blessed One teach me, let the Blissful One teach me, the definition of imagination of what doesn't actually exist. Why, what, how, and to whom does imagination of the unreal occur when it is happening? Imagination of what doesn't actually exist has been called by the Blessed One imagination of what doesn't actually exist. To what phenomenon, Blessed One, does the expression, imagination of what doesn't actually exist, refer? And how does imagination of what doesn't actually exist come to be when? Imagining specifically. Quote. The Blessed One said, Good, good, Mahamati. It is good indeed that you think instruction should be sought on this matter. You have undertaken to benefit many people, Mahamati, for the happiness of Many people, out of compassion for the world, for the sake of the mass of living beings, for the welfare and happiness of celestials and humans. So listen, Mahamati, and take it to heart accurately and aptly. I will tell you. Quote. Very well, Blessed One. So saying, the great Bodhisattva Mahamati listened to the Blessed One. The Blessed One said this to him. Imagination takes place proceeding from immersion in mental construction of a variety of objects that don't actually exist. And in people engrossed in immersion in the grasped and the grasper. Mahamati. Whose minds have not ascertained that these are only subjective perceptions. And who have fallen into extremes of notions of being and non-being and have nurtured impressions of the specific constructions of hallowed opinions. Through immersion in grasping of various external objects disturbance of mind and psyche occurs, communicated through imagination, taking place through immersion in self and possessory interest. Quote. Mahamati said. Then. Blessed One. If imagination takes place proceeding from immersion in mental construction of a diverse variety of objects in people who have fallen into extremes of notions of being and non-being, 
who have nurtured specific conceptions of hallowed notions of what can be apprehended and what apprehends. Due to immersion in grasping various external objects disturbance of mind and psyche occurs, communicated through imagination. Taking place through immersion in various things existent and non-existent due to failure to realize their only subjective perceptions. Then just as the varied appearance of external objects. The appearance of falling into extremes of being and non-being, is unrelated to existence and non-existence, void of the characteristics defined by these notions, so it has none of the characteristics of measure, capacity, element, example, or reason, in an ultimate sense. Then why does varied imagination take place only in conceiving immersion in varied existence that has no real substance? While imagination does not take place in conceiving immersion in the characteristics of ultimate truth. No, blessed one, a doctrine with inconsistent reasoning sticks to you in saying it occurs in one and not the other, while saying. Immersion in extremes of being and non-being is the development of views from imagination of what is not. Like construing, by means of imagination, the semblance of a single complete form from the variety in a person made by the diverse elements of a magic trick. Hence the non-existence of the various things, with the cessation of imagination. This is fallen into the mode of thinking of materialism. Quote, the Blessed One said, Imagination, Mahamati, neither goes on nor ceases. Why? Due to the inapplicability of imagination of being and non-being because of the absence of existence of external objects. Due to awareness that they are only subjective perceptions. Mahamati, imagination neither goes on nor ceases, except by the construction of imagination of a variety of subjective thoughts on the part of the unenlightened. I say that imagination takes place accompanied by activity, through immersion in the appearance of existence of variety. How then, Mahamati, can unenlightened ordinary people, freed of ideas of self and possession through awareness that their own imaginations are only thought, freed of the ill consequences of assumptions of effect and cause, having experienced a withdrawal from mental relation by realizing it is only subjective perception, accomplished in knowledge in all the stages. Attain the state of first-hand realization of those who arrive at reality themselves, the cessation of mental construction of the notion of self-existent substance in the five elements. So it is for this reason, Mahamati, that it is said by me, imagination comes from immersion in a variety of things that don't exist. One is liberated by thorough knowledge of the meaning of the substance of the variety of subjective imagination as it is. Single quote. So it is said, those for whom the world operates by causes and conditions, are hooked on the four extremes. They are not experts in my teaching. The world does not come to be if it isn't existing, nor if existing, nor yet both existing and not existing by conditions and by causes. As imagined by the unenlightened. When one sees the world as not existing. And not not existing, not real or unreal, then the mind is freed. And discovers selflessness. All things from which conditions come about are unoriginated, for effect is all conditions. Nothing comes from effect. Effect does not come from effect. Duality would be implied of effect, and becoming from effect is not found by adherence to duality. When one sees the construct it has no objective support, it is surely only mental, so I say it is thought content. Matter, the basis of nature, is unrelated to becoming by conditions. Eternal existence, supreme Brahma, I say is this matter. For soul is not there as an existing thing really as represented. The nature of the clusters as clusters like that is representational, not as an objective thing. Equality is fourfold. Characteristic, cause, becoming 
and a quality of selflessness is the fourth for practitioners. The cessation of all views is detached from imagined and imagining. I say the content of thought is void of real perception and is counterfeit. Not existence, nor non-existence either, unconnected to existence and non-existence, as such I say the matter of mind is independent of thought. The end of emptiness as such is nirvana of the reality realm. The diverse mental body, I say, is made of mind. The occurrence of varied thought is bound by the impressions of imagination. For what is attributed to the world is only mental but appears external to people. What is seen is not found externally. Thought appears diverse. Body, possessions, and abode I say are contents of thought. Quote, At that point Mahamati, the great Bodhisattva, said this to the Blessed One. How about what has been said by the Blessed One, that great Bodhisattvas and others should not grasp meaning as articulated? How not, Blessed One, is a great Bodhisattva not one who grasps meaning as articulated? And what is articulation? What is meaning? Quote, the Blessed One said, Then listen, Mahamati, and take it to heart accurately and aptly. I will tell you. Quote, Very well, Blessed One. So saying, the great Bodhisattva Mahamati listened to the Blessed One. The Blessed One said this to him. Then what, Mahamati, is articulation? It refers to discourse produced by the teeth, jaws, palate, tongue, and space between the lips, forming correspondences between words and letters, causing conceptual impressions. This is called articulation. Then what, Mahamati, is meaning? With insight substantiated by thought and meditation on what has been heard. The one flavored path to the city of Nirvana preceded by turning away from dependence on impressions by one's own intelligence. Examining the attainment defined by the particular meanings in the states of the stages in the domain of one's own first-hand attainment, a great bodhisattva becomes familiar with meaning. Furthermore, Mahamati, a great bodhisattva who is familiar with articulation and meaning sees articulation as other and not other from meaning, and meaning from articulation. Now if meaning were other than what is articulated, it would be based on expression of unarticulated meaning. But that meaning is accessed by articulation, like a valued object, by means of a lamp. Just as a person might hold up a lamp to look upon a valued object. This specific item of mine is here in this particular place. In the same way, Mahamati, by means of the lamp of articulation of verbal instructions great bodhisattvas gain access to first-hand ultimate attainment beyond verbal construction. Furthermore, Mahamati by becoming engrossed in immersion in meaning as articulated in respect to undestroyed unoriginated, completely extinct by nature. Three vehicles. One vehicle. Five elements. Mind. Nature. And so on. One falls into ideas of attribution and denial. Construing them otherwise than as they are used. Like the false imagination of seeing a variety in a magic trick, just as an illusory variety is imagined other than as it should be viewed, by children but not by full-fledged adults. So it is said, having construed as articulated, they attribute thingness. Due to that attribution, they fall into the abode of hell. For self is not found with the clusters, nor the clusters in self. They are not as imagined, but they are not non-existent. If the existence of all things as the ignorant imagine were as viewed, all would be seers of reality. Due to the non-existence of defilement of all things, there is no state of purity. They are not as viewed, yet not non-existent. And also, Mahamati, I will teach you a description of knowledge and consciousness. By means of which description of knowledge and consciousness?
involving suitable distinction, you and other great bodhisattvas, having realized the import of the description of knowledge and consciousness, may quickly awaken supreme perfect enlightenment. <laughs>